Tour and, and he's involved in this as I am. He only got started a couple years ago. Um, I started this in 2000. And I found a little boat on a shelf in a box in an antique shop up in Adamsdale. And uh, the hull was stuck to the newspaper. Turns out um, it was a boat that was built in the 30s without a rig. Um, so I did some research and restored it. It was all downhill from there. I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 boats. I have some very unusual boats. Uh, the boat here with the white and green hull is a one of a kind. It's the only model that I'm aware of anywhere. Um, a friend of mine who built that, actually my, my mentor built that. Um, I put a PowerPoint presentation together to keep me on target. Joe wanted me to talk about how the boats are built and I nudged some other things into the presentation so you can get a feel um, for this hobby sport, whatever you want to call it. It was actually a, um, a trial event in the 1935 Olympics and an American won that, which really ticked off yep. uh, John Black uh, from the Boston area. So um, we're going to walk through this. If you are sitting on the sides and the boats are in the way, uh, feel free to shift to the center. Um, I call this a brief encounter because there are only about 15, 17 slides. Um, and I'm focusing on certain things. I could have had 50 slides in the presentation because one of the, the, the subjects that I hated the most in school was history. How to get involved in the history of Maui Yacht, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I actually am the president of the British Maui Yacht Group, which is an organization that preserves the history of Maui Yacht and, and the boats that we see on the sail. Um, every boat up here today is an actual working sailing model, so they can be put in the water. All but this red and white hull over here are remote control after they the free sail, but I'll explain that as I go through the presentation. Um, historically, the first documented reference to Mavi Yachting that we can find was in 1855 in the uh, Illustrated London News, and it's a picture of a model yacht being skiff sail. Skiff sail, there is skiff sail and it goes on throughout the world. It's very rare. In the US, it was primarily done in northeast harbors. And the boats were significantly different in that they had a very deep keel and a very big rig. I had trouble sailing with my thumbs with a remote control transmitter and avoiding hitting other boats on the water. Can you imagine the nightmare of 12, 15 boats on the water sailing the course, and it was all freezing. They were not the remote control. Rowing your boat, touching your boat to turn it, it was going off course, and not running over your nearest competitor. I just can't wrap my head around that, but they did it. And this is a picture more of the gentleman class in England in a boat with one model on the water, obviously. Um, they still sail in Hyde Park. Uh, they don't sail in the surface. They, uh, they sail on the ground pond in, in, uh, in uh, London. So how did we get to remote control? Boats started out as free sail, free sail boats. Size boats on the water. Early on in model yachting, they actually handicapped the boats that were racing. So you sailed three races. You took every boat had a timer who was timing it. They figured out the times, they calculated the handicap, and then that's how the boats were scored at the end of the day. Today we would never have the patience to do that. Uh, we. Uh, have designed boat classes so that boats are, are um, categorized by their rule and generally hull length. Today we have a schooner, a marblehead class. Um, this model of uh, Coquina is what we would call an open class boat. This is an open class boat. The catamaran is an open class boat. The two on the end are both 
uh, 36, finished 36 class boats. The American Model Yachting Association has um, 30 some classes of boats. The Vintage Group supports seven classes of older boats. Okay, and everything you see here is classified as a vintage boat. I don't have any modern boats here today. Uh, in the late 1800s, Tesla designed a remote control boat. It was a power boat. It was this, um, exhibited at the exposition in New York, the World Exposition in New York. And it had actually had stepper motors and he had some kind of a control device that sent a signal to the masts that told the stepper motors how to steer the boat and how to make how fast to make the boat or how slow to make the boat. So 1898. In 1934, Packard of Hewlett Packard, what uh, I guess a grandfather or whatever, designed the first remote control sailboat. And if you ever saw the diagram of the electronics of what was in that boat, there wasn't a whole lot of room inside of that boat for anything else but the electronics. Huge battery, they had big stepper motors, they had things that controlled the, turn the stepper motors on and off to drive the boat to adjust the sails. Um, very complicated, but in 1934. Today we're sailing with small transmitters with little receivers in the boat. Um, this is a, a, a shot at the Vintage Nationals. These are all Marblehead class boats, 50 inches long, 800 square inches of sail, and a couple, a few other small rules. It's an open class of sailboats. The sailboats that the club here sails are victorious, and they are um, a one design class. So you pretty much have to fall, um, sail the boat that comes in the kit. You can make some adaptations as you build it. So they're open class um, boats, and there are um, boats with uh, a lot of controls on them. Um, the free sail boats were steered in a lot of different ways, and I have uh, examples um, a couple of ways here today. Um, they had a quadrant, well, let's start earlier. Upper right, a weighted rudder. So as the wind pressed the sails over to the side, the weight could be adjusted and it could flop over to auto adjust the boat to keep it on as straight a course as possible. It wasn't very effective. We have um, simple steering mechanisms, bottom left, which is um, a tiller with a rubber band, so kind of an elastic, that as pressure was placed on the sails and pressure on the, on the rudder, this, the rubber band kept bringing the rudder back to center to steer it straight. The quadrant was a much more complicated mechanism with a lot of lines on the deck that you would adjust. In those boats, you sail downwind with one setup, or upwind, you beat upwind by tacking. They were sailed on ponds that were built just for that. They were rectangular, probably um, 150 feet by 450 feet. And you generally had a crew of at least three or four people handling the boat. If you go, if you look up in the back to the left-hand photo, you see the poles in the hands? Those are turning poles. So these boats are coming in on a tack and they're being turned to send them back to the other shore. Okay, so you had to have somebody on each shore. You had to have somebody at one end to set a boat on a, on a run downwind and somebody to catch it at the other end. Because if the wind was up, they're coming in hard. And there's a, there's a, a video online um, in um, Fleetwood, England with like a 20 knot wind. I'll tell you what, it's an aerobic workout. You don't have to go to the gym if you're sailing one of these boats because they're running, they're running down the sides. The person at the end catching the boat generally jumps into the pond to stop it because some of these boats, the larger boats, could weigh 60 and 70 pounds, mm. and they're coming at you hard. So um, there was a lot to it. I, I've never free sailed a boat, and I understand it's very complicated uh, to do that. You have to really understand much more than we know today. To make the things go. So back to the steering mechanisms. Um, 
and then you have the vein steering, which is the, the most, the newest, up through the 50s, they, they vein steered. The first vein steering uh, mechanism was designed by, El, uh, by Nate Harrishaw in the late 1800s, really never took off, really never got into use until into the 30s. And then it was uh, used almost exclusively 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and then the remote control started to come into play. The vein steering mechanisms, this is one for a larger boat. Um, it was attached to the rudder above the deck and it, 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 it was hinged and it would compensate for pressure on the sails and it auto adjust the rudder. It was very accurate on keeping the boats on a straight course. The other thing that kept boats on a straight course was the shape of the hull. The hull was shaped very differently than the hulls are today on the boats. The blue boats uh, was a free sail boat. That's my very favorite boat. Um, that is a Marblehead class, and if you examine the hull afterwards, after the presentation, um, the keel starts to form early, way up here. It gets pronounced, comes into the, the full keel, and then there's a fin here. This boat does not like to turn. So when I'm, remote, when I'm using remote controls on this boat, I have to carve my turn. I have to anticipate, come wide and come through the turn like this. Where the modern boats, you can spin them on a dime. This boat doesn't think that way. So uh, anyway, um, as I mentioned, it was an aerobic exercise. Today we sit and sail. We generally sit on our butts and work our thumbs. So. We always ask the, the guys when they show up at the pond, did you do your thumb exercises this week? Because that's about all the exercise uh, compared to the workout that you got when you were free sailing. So we have a receiver, a radio, other electronics, our thumbs and chairs. Um, you can see in the lower right, one of our, a, a transmitter. And then, um, the electronics you see in the left hand photograph, that's a 17 inch model. So there's a lot of stuff in uh, the cabin of that boat. It's all fairly small. Um, that one, the receiver, or the, uh, um, the runner servo on the upper left side of that cockpit is only about that big, very small. And then uh, of course, this is a, a national event with us uh, standing control of our boats. Um, and where do we sail these things? There were actually purpose-built ponds in the U.S. Um, all of these cities that are mentioned all had, well, most of them had purpose-built ponds. Uh, Marblehead has Red's Pond. Red's Pond has been there forever. Very interesting pond to sail on. Um, Philadelphia had five locations in the city. All of them were purpose-built ponds. None of them are there anymore. The first one was down with, on the island where the Navy Yard is. Um, one was up where they put the extension of Route 1 across the, uh, the Schuylkill River, and when they filled that in, the pond got filled in. Uh, San Francisco has Spreckles Pond, very famous Central Park has um, uh, Conservatory Waters, uh, which is the main pond. There was another pond over in, in Brooklyn, and there was one uh, in the Bronx. In New York City. Uh, Washington DC has a reflecting pond. No longer allowed to sail on it <laughs> because you've got a transmitter and they don't know what you've got in the boat. So we, we tried on a couple of occasions and they don't even want to talk to us. Uh, but that, that pond um, was sailed on for the longest time. With the Northeast harbors were used for skiff sailing as I mentioned. As I mentioned. Um, if that blue boat was a skiff sail boat that keel would probably be 50 to 70 percent deeper and the rig would probably be at, by the same math figure that much bigger um, i don't know how they kept up with it so you see conservatory waters in central park lower left that's cape porpoise harbor upper left 
Lower right is Sparrow Lagoon, right along the Charles River in Boston. Um, they renovated that area, full model yachting in 1910, I think. Spent a million dollars back then to do it. And then up, upper right is Irvington, New Jersey, and that gray area on the right is actually the pond that was built in that park for model yachting. So they were around. A lot of WPA money was spent on model yachting ponds. The one in Chicago, right along Lakeshore Drive, which they don't use anymore because there's no parking, was a WPA pond. Uh, Roosevelt was a big model yachting fan. <clears throat> he taught his grandchildren how to sail the model yachts. And we have photographs of him in the Oval Office tinkering with model yachts. And they, he had them up at Hyde Park. If you've ever been to Hyde Park, there are model yachts in the first room you go in, in the uh, cottage. Let's talk about construction techniques for a few minutes. How are these things built? Because these are all built by hand. Um, and various techniques have been used through the years from taking a block of wood and carving it. They were generally a smaller model. And of course, that wood had to be real dry when you did it. You had to stabilize it after you finished it. And it's probably going to check and get a crack in it at some point because it's a solid block of wood. Um, the plank on frame boats. Um, Coquina right here is a um, a plank boat, but it's lot straight planked. Um, this is a plank boat. When you look at this, you can see the plank. You can't see the planks on the outside, but this this has planking. You can see it on the inside. Um, yeah, they're they're the only two plank boats that are here. Um, there are two types of bread and butter boats. Bread and butter means that you slap pieces of wood together and you smear glue between them. This is a waterline bread and butter boat. And you can see here, you've got a bunch of donuts you put together. And this boat has, and this for demonstration purposes, has screws in it which would not be there in the final boat. So you carve the outside of the hull. And then this all gets carved down smooth till you have about a quarter of an inch of nicely shaped hull when you're finished. The other type of um, bread and butter construction, buttocks construction. Oh, by the way, this, this is a bread and butter boat also. So if you look at it, you can see the layers this way. The blue boat is a buttocks construction, which is a very rare form of bread and butter. That's when, the, these are called lifts, okay? These are horizontal lifts in this uh, boat. In the blue boat, they're vertical lifts, which in my mind makes a whole lot more sense if you have a good straight central piece to work from. Carving is the same, but most everybody did the bread, um, the, the borderline bread and butter versus the buttocks bread and butter. Um, hard chine planking. The far boat, the schooner on the end, that's hard chine. So you've got two panels, two more panels with a hard chine in the hull. This is a hard chine boat here. And you've got a side panel, a side panel, and, a, and two bottom pieces. They all they get fared in very nicely. It's a quick build compared to plank on frame. So here, here you can see the difference between, this is a plan of um, a Marblehead class boat. And the water lines are the horizontal lines on the hull. And the plan on the top for the, the, uh, the side view. The buttocks lines are the vertical lines in the plan that run fore and aft. And the, um, the frame lines are the stations that run vertically through the boat this way. <clears throat> so when you're building a, a plank and frame boat, you start with a central uh, member that you fasten the frames to. So you have your building board, you fasten the frames with a little block, you put in your keelson, which in this case has the lead keel. 
that's that dark area at the top. You would never put that on at this stage of construction. It would be too hard to handle to turn the boat over. So you're going to do all your construction. One of the last things you do is put on the ballast. And then you start applying your planks. And norm, the normal procedure is to do three on a side. When the glue is set, do three on another on the other side. That way the, the, the torsion from the glue drying doesn't start to torque the boat in one direction or the other. And then as you get up into the keel area, up in here, then the, the, the fitting of the planks gets very interesting. Because you're not, not only cutting them to length and trimming the ends, but you're probably shaping them along their length to fit into the planking as you go. And that can, that's just, ooh. So the bread and butter is just a series of pieces, each a little smaller than the one before, wide enough that it can lay on that first piece, with enough room that when you carve it, uh, the shape goes together very nicely. This is the buttocks method, so you can see the vertical pieces laid together. Hard chine. So you see the frame. You see the first piece laid on it would be the um, starboard side hull piece. Then you fare that in. That means that you sand it in and get it nice and even. Then you lay the, the port piece in. And then you put the starboard side on and then the port side. And that goes together. Depending on how quickly your glue sets today, you can probably have that hull done in a day. It goes pretty quick. We have a real advantage today with the quality of our glues. The boats that were built in the 30s and 40s, I've restored boats. I, I restored an, an International A boat, which is, this one was 84 inches long, weighed 65 pounds. When the man went to take it out of his car, I could see the whole boat twisting. 90% of the glue joints had failed in the boat. And that's because the high glues that they use just didn't last very long. So our glues today, even, even like tight bond, that has a longevity that we don't know about. Epoxy is very good. So we have excellent adhesives today, which, we, which means we can build lighter and smaller. The materials can be lighter and smaller in nature because the glues are very good and hold them together. At Wooden Boat, there's a class on building the Marblehead class boat. About six years ago, they realized that they could take the frames out when the boats were done. They didn't need the frames any longer to maintain the hull strength because the glues are of such quality. You know, we only leave a couple of frame members in where we need a mount of electronics or right under the mast where there's a lot of compression uh, pressure um, when the sails are loaded there. So there's a lot we're learning as we go through the processes. So that's the hard chine construction. Composite construction refers a lot to fiberglass, but now Kevlar and carbon fiber are being used. This particular boat is a British boat, the orange boat, that sailed um, on Round Pond in London. And it's uh, the fiberglass on it is not a fiberglass um, fabric. It goes like this, it's a matting which is very unusual. So it must have been sprayed on over the mold um, when the boat was made. Um, and then the little gray hull, that's a, a, 36, a vintage 36 hull, Chico hull, sitting on a Marblehead class boat. That Marblehead class boat is a skiff sail boat. Um, I don't know if you can realize it by looking at it because it's very dark underneath, but it has a real deep keel on it. So a dead giveaway that I was sailed up from a skiff. And then you have cold molding, which is a technique, um, actually it was used on models fairly early on. Um, you make a, a male mold, you put a coat of fiberglass on it, and then you lay strips of veneer over that, and then another of fiberglass 
So you've got one coat of veneer, which is one thirty-second of an inch, and two layers of fiberglass. Talk about a light hull and a beautiful hull. Those hulls are absolutely beautiful when they're done. Um, but that's cold molding. I have not tried that technique. There's a, a friend of mine in Maine who's been working on it recently, um, and I'm anxious to see uh, what kind of results he had. A former member of the vintage, well, a member of the vintage group, a former officer of the group. He did some cold molding, and there was a lot of cold molding done on the West Coast um, years ago. Uh, but it's an interesting technique. It makes a very, very lightweight ball. Um, so, what, are, what boats are sailed? I mentioned earlier the number of classes with AMYA and uh, the vintage group. Um, in many classes, they're similar, but they're different. <laughs> The Marble <coughs> class, I was sitting on the, the side of Red's Pond one day between races, and the oldest guy in the club came in and sat down. He was not known for talking to anybody. And he came and sat down. He said, you know, young fella, he said, in the late 30s, when nobody was working, they could build one of these boats for a buck. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see so many different marble heads. The blue boat is one off. It's the only one known. I've seen many marble heads, like the Madcap was a very successful marble head. A lot of people own the Madcap today. They built plank, plank it or they buy a, plas, a fiberglass hull and build it out. It's a boat that shouldn't sail well, it does. That boat is a one-off. I've seen many one-offs. I've seen a lot of uh, similar marble heads because they've been, they were successful. You can see a lot of Cheerios. Uh, John Black, that's what he won uh, the Olympic trial event. Germany with was a Cheerio 1 and every year he built a different Cheerio for three years so there's Cheerio 1, a Cheerio 2, and a Cheerio 3 um, but they are um, an open class with only a few, a few controls on the boat. Length, the sails are the biggest ones and then the one design is like uh, the Victoria. We sail a soling there, there are a number of one design classes out there. Um, and believe it or not, there were a lot of school programs around the country. The most famous is the one um, in Detroit, which began in 1929 as a club. Two years later, the school district allowed them in manual arts to teach it in um, the middle, I'll say the middle years, which we would think of as middle school, because they had some interesting grade arrangements in, this, in that district junior highs and high school so they built a 20 they actually have two 24 inch boats um, that they that they built uh, they built a 30 inch in the junior highs and then they built a 30 actually they built also they built a marble head advanced students could build a marble head um, at the high school level so they were building the 36 the chico and i think they were building the bad cap um, as well I have four or five of the Detroit school boats at home, and I restored a bunch. Um, and initially, they made their own fittings, they made their own sails. I mean, think about all the different materials that they were doing. And then, as the class, the, the length of classes got shorter, they started buying their fittings from AJ Fisher, which was a company making the fittings right outside of Detroit. Um, so that's a a picture of the kids working. Um, that program closed in 2003. But there were programs in other cities. The one in Los Angeles, um, what's the name of the boat? There's a large sailboat that's now up on Lake Union in Seattle. And the program in Los Angeles was building, oh, Pirate, was building a small version of Pirate in, in certain schools in, in LA. Um, it's not easy to build a model of a full-size boat. Mathematically, the dynamics change. If you were to build it with the same size rig proportionally on it, it won't sit well. It'll, it'll want to lay over on its side, so you've got to downsize the rig. So you've got to get somebody who understands naval architecture involved if you're going to take a large boat and make a model out, because you've got to make some alterations to it. Um, The lake that's um, Belle Isle is the lake on, or that's the lake that was built for model yachting 
um, from the Detroit schools. And every year at the end of the, the, the term, the kids came out, there were five, 600 kids out sailing their boats, and they were all free sail boats. Uh, so they had a little dock, and um, they gave prizes out. It was, it was kind of a fun thing. So they, they also told, taught the kids sail, how to sail, so they understood what they were doing, how to rig the boats, tune the boats, and the whole um, big boat designers were heavily in the models. This is a picture of Nate Harshaw with his driver testing his wishbone rigged model. So he didn't have regular booms on it. He had that wishbone uh, going out with the clue for both of the sails. This boat is um, owned by um, Mystic. It never sees the light of day. Mystic has a whole collection of model yachts that's in a back room with the lights turn on when you walk in. They're on these big shelving racks and they, they're never, well, I, I think now they just opened a small thing with a few yachts in. But uh, that's, that's the ocean. Um, his brother, L. Francis, was probably, Nate Harishoff designed all those America's Cup boats that were so successful. He was about going fast. The boats were utilitarian. They weren't necessarily pretty boats. L. Francis built beautiful, well sailed um, sailboats. And he was located because Nate never let, let him work for the company in Bristol, Rhode Island. So L. Francis lived in Marblehead, and that's where his studio was. His, his Naval Architecture studio was. And then, of course, Norman Skeen, a um, uh, famous boat designer with elements of design. He, he, uh, he also designed models, and there were others. And so I'm going to stop there, yep, and I'm going to just tell you what's up here, and then we can probably ask questions.